Hey guys, it's Mr. Sheline here. Uh, this is going to be the notes for Unit 3.2, covering energy transformations. Okay, so let's just get straight to it. So here are your learning objectives for this uh, unit or unit section. So uh, by the end of this week, I want you to be able to define the term energy, which you should be able to do already since we've already been working on this for a week, a week and a half or so. Um, and I also want you to be able to accurately show energy changing from one form to another form, okay? And also that you can apply and define the law of conservation of energy, okay? So now that we know what, we, what I expect you guys to understand by the end of the week, let's just get straight to it. So energy uh, conservation. So this is going to be kind of a review slash uh, adding new material here. So think back to when we were talking about atoms and how atoms when they when uh, they begin or, or when we are given a particular set of atoms and they go through uh, chemical change or they go through or they're represented in a chemical formula as a, in a chemical equation what we start with is what we have to end with okay whatever atoms we begin with they need to be at the end of the equation once we're all done and we talked about Antoine Lavoisier being the guy kind of coming up with that so Antoine Lavoisier remember came up with the idea that you can neither create nor destroy matter and he explained this through his his law of conservation of matter that's, that's what he he proposed way back in the day um and and uh, uh because he noticed in chemical equations you would pretty much have the same materials at the end that you began with. And not only that, the same amount. And that's where also Dalton came along and Dalton also helped them along with that. And that's where uh, Dalton's findings pretty much solidified that roughly about 200 years after Lavoisier came up with his. Okay, but then Einstein comes along and Einstein with, with his own branch pretty much of physics was, uh, and this is where it bleeds into non, you know, just just so you know, because I say it like that because there's a difference between new, new, Newtonian physics and also Einsteinian physics. Um, so we don't get into that at all. Uh, but here I'll just quick reference it that, that Einstein does have his own branch of physics based upon his own calculations. Now, it's not to say that completely nullifies or, or just ignores new, Newton's uh, uh, branch of physics. It's just to say that Einstein's is much more theoretical and it's and it's much more... Uh, calculative, calculative base rather than a, a ob observed. Um, and so what Einstein here says in, is in his branch is that pretty much energy is matter, which for the most part is something that, that most physicists uh, uh, agree with today and, and uh, go along with that. Once you break things down uh, into the to atoms, in, and then even smaller than that, what atoms are made of, both both what protons, neutrons, and electrons are made of. What we find out is is that pretty much just all of life is, you know, because all of life is made of matter and is made of atoms. All of those things must be made of energy. They are all little itty bitty forms of energy that just radiate in different ways. And so he shows that in this in the equation E equals mc squared, where energy is equal to the mass times the speed of, of light squared. Um, it's just to say that, again, matter, mass, is energy. Okay? So, idea being that if Anton Lavoisier says that, that matter can neither be created nor destroyed, then energy also can neither be created or destroyed. Uh, and, and we can just simply change the law of conservation of matter into the name, the law of conservation of energy, which, as you can see here, are pretty much the same two things. So, again, I, I reiterate, you know, what the law of conservation is. It states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Um, and, and, again, just touched on that, and I just reiterated it just to make it clearer uh, what I'm talking about in the previous slide. So it's, it's pretty much to say this, because this is – because I'm, I'm sure you can think of ways and, and places where you're like, well, Mr. Sheline, I, I did X, Y, and Z and noticed that, that I had less of a thing at the end than I started with. And, and so my answer to that would be, well, problem is you probably did not have a closed system. So a closed system is something I've, I've mentioned this before through in class, but not explicitly, but a closed system is more or less just a system that doesn't allow things to be lost. It, it, it's, it provides a particular barrier of what's in a test and what's outside of a test. And the idea being is that, that 
uh, a closed system would be where you could contain all, all variables uh, and measure all the variables so you can account for all the variables uh, in a particular uh, test and then talk about them and, and sh measure them and show them, calculate them at the end. Um, but anyway, so in a closed system, energy can only be converted from one form of energy from, to another. Also, it, it's, it's, it's a specific way of saying that it's a specific way of saying that that here, uh, if we also ignore some variables. So, so one in physics that we ignore a lot is air resistance. Um, of course, this isn't you know my physics class, but as a, as like an example, we would say that in a closed system, meaning that that or or in a closed system where we're ignoring air resistance, find blah blah blah. Uh, and, and same thing happens here. So if we wanted to talk about the energy conversions from one form to another, there's some that we're going to kind of ignore. And there's some that we're going to say that, you know, uh, we're not really wanting to show this because either I or A, it's, it's so small and so minuscule that we just don't care or B, um, uh, or B it's, it's just something that maybe is actually not there, but there is that still that possibility. Uh, what else it does is that it, it more or less just allows us on paper to make better calculations. So could we accurately predict, like if, if you take your hand and if you rub your hand across, like on the desk or on a desk or on a table, uh, a whole bunch and you know, you're, you're rubbing, rubbing the table, you're obviously creating thermal energy. You're create your, your, uh, your create, well, you're, you're transforming, chemical energy in your arm to, to mechanical energy uh, from your hand to the table. Uh, and then it's thermal energy uh, that's being released in the form of heat uh, between your hand and the table. There's also some chemical energy too. Uh, and there's some sound energy uh, that's being lost here. And in a closed system, uh, it would just be to say that, that you know, in, if we were to say in a closed system, uh, we're gonna, we, we would know that there's X amount of thermal energy, there's X amount of sound energy, there's X amount of um, uh, chemical energy that's being transferred here. Problem is, is that in real life, we don't know exactly how much, but in a closed system, if you can somewhat measure it, you can get a decent number on it and you can go ahead and calculate what you began with to what you ended with. Uh, so long way of saying that the definition of a closed system is, is a, it's a system that we use in science in order to base our calculations and to solve for problems that we have a hard time understanding uh, so that we can, in, in where we can account for things that we can account for and sometimes ignore things that we really can't account for. Okay. So again, a long way of saying that if, if you're still kind of confused on that, uh, it's fine. Uh, get a hold of me. This isn't something that you're going to be tested on like this closed system. It's just, I'm, I'm trying my best to explain what it, what it means. Uh, Cause it may, this, this term will come back up throughout the year. Um, so anyway, so the total amount of energy that begins a conversion has to also be present at the end of a conversion. So this is just more or less a reiteration of the law of conservation of energy. Uh, this is where all those different energy forms uh, come into play here as well. So in the previous uh, unit section, uh, 3.1, you went over all of those, I think it was eight different uh, energy types, energy forms. And here we're going to be uh, showing and, and figuring out how we start with one where we go from, from one to another. Um, and then just real quick, so there's a GIF that's here at the top of, of my slide. So if you know the name of this, that's awesome. If you don't, this is what's called Newton's Cradle. So I'm sure you guys have seen this I don't know how many times, whether it's in music videos, if it's in, in a cartoon, if it's in a movie of some kind, if it's in a video game, uh, th this thing is, is seen everywhere. Maybe it's starting to kind of phase out a little bit, but, but I know for myself that I, I, I could not watch a TV show that involved school uh, that didn't have one of these in here. Uh, meaning that there is usually a teacher that always, like a, a teacher character that would have one of these at their desk, even if they were like an English teacher or something. It just it just was one of those things that's like, ah, teacher. So they must have Newton's cradle. Um, so so real quick, it, it's the I, I put this gif in here just as as a a really good example of of 
how it is that that um, the law of conservation of energy works here. Now, just understand that that this guy right here, this GIF is on a loop, so obviously it's not really showing you know what would actually happen in real life because we would know that in real life this guy would actually begin to slow down and and eventually would come to a stop where there would there wouldn't be anything um uh, there none of the these little balls would be moving anymore but what it, it really is cool to show is is that you have if you let's say pull the ball when it's like right here when the ball is at that moment and it's released there there's potential energy and then when you let release it, that potential energy turns into kinetic energy. That kinetic energy uh, then forms into like mechanical energy right here when it hits that one. And then the energy transfers all the way through all of those balls up until it gets to this last guy here. And then it continues the motion and then it rinses and repeats and moves back and then it transfers the energy, but in this direction. Okay, so it's a it's a really really cool and simple example of where or, or or where energy starts in one side goes out to the other. Um, why does it slow down then? It slows down due to friction because anything uh, any surface that touches one another has, uh, for the most part, a, a particular measurable amount of friction due to the chemical bonds between all of the uh, atoms. Uh, there's there's a little bit of electromagnetic uh, and, and also yeah, electromagnetic um, and chemical energy that, that uh, uh, slows it down, uh, repels and attracts one another um, and, and uh, slows it down in that way. And, and uh, so then it slows down due to friction. There's energy that's lost in the form of, of heat um, in thermal energy. Uh, there's a little bit that's lost as sound. Uh, there's, uh, a little bit, excuse me, <sighs> depending how hard these hit, there may be some lost as light or electromagnetic, more of electromagnetic uh, uh, energy, so on and so forth. So anyway, so let's keep on going. Come on. So here are those energy forms again. So there's the kinetic energy, potential energy, mechanical energy, thermal, chemical, electro electrical, electromagnetic, and nuclear. And I put this image on the side here just to kind of get you going to really thinking about what we're doing here as far as uh, en energy conservation and energy conversion is concerned. So, so this is, a, I would say, a really good example that you should, oops, that you should come back to. Oh, come on. That you should come back to. Uh, just just as a reference, let's kind of I mean let's take a look at here at this. So so here it starts with forms of energy in the, in the middle, and and it starts at at this form forms of energy in here. Actually, I'm going to underline that. So it starts with this forms of energy here in the center, and then it 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 pretty much just kind of branches out. So let's say we start with mechanical energy. Well, what does mechanical energy do? Well, it it allows a, a frog to leap. It allows a car to move. Um, what else? So thermal energy, what does thermal energy do? It, it, thermal energy is seen through heating soup. It's seen when uh, ice cream melts, so on and so on. Now it doesn't have all of them that, that I mentioned on the side here, but it's just a good way to remember like, you know, the, the different forms of energy, how it is that we see them, because it's important to know where we start and then where we can then end off with, uh, and, and see how it is that the energy is transferred. Okay. So let's just, oops, let's just keep on going. So here's an example of energy con uh, energy conversion. So um, let's say that you push a toy across the floor, and eventually uh, your toy slows down after you push it. So so it's not so much that you're holding it. Excuse me. <laughs> it's not to say that you're holding holding this and you're pushing it as you move with the car. It's it's you have the car and you give it a good push. And eventually that car is going to come to a stop after you pushed it. Um, so how do we break that down? How do we talk about the conversion of that energy? Well, in order for you to have pushed that car, you needed to use chemical energy that you stored in your body from the food you ate. So you eat the, the food, uh, whatever it was the last thing you ate. So you ate the food. It's stored in the form of chemical energy in your body. You then transfer that chemical energy into mechanical energy to then move your arm 
okay, to move your arm to push this car. And then in the process of moving your arm to push that car, that mechanical energy then is transferred and transforms into kinetic energy as it moves the car. And that car then will use that as, uh, it'll use that kinetic energy as, as mechanical energy as well. Ooh, excuse me. Oh my goodness. Sorry. And then that car slows down due to friction, thus producing a loss of energy in the form of thermal energy, uh, electrical energy, because there's a little bit of, you know, there'll, there'll be a little bit of static electricity probably built up in there. Um, and then also chemical energy, because you are probably going to be breaking some bonds. Um, uh, you're going to be breaking some bonds down. You're going to be, you know, wearing out the tires, the little, the little wheels on the car. Um, you know, it's all part of the process. Uh, so, so here again, we start with chemical in your body. That chemical energy transforms into mechanical energy in the form of you pushing the car. The car then moves, and then that's kinetic energy. Uh, the car, as it's moving, is is using that uh, kinetic energy as mechanical energy, uh, just because that while it's moving, it's both it both has uh, kinetic and potential energy. Um, and then, as it's slowing down due to friction, there's a loss of energy th uh, thermally in the form of heat, electrical energy, where there's a buildup uh, and maybe even discharge of electro uh, or electrical energy. Uh, and then also chemical energy um, uh, that's also going to be lost by, by you know, little itty bitty microscopic pieces of, of the wheels and the tires chipping off because it's having to continually grip and uh, grip and, and uh, uh, rub against a surface. And then here's some other examples and pretty much the rest of the, the notes are just examples because it, this is one of those things that you got to really break down uh, all of these phenomenon. So, so energy conversion is still going on here. So uh, now that we know that energy can be converted from one form to another, uh, like I said, the remaining slides are going to contain examples like these two below. So let's look at a flashlight pretty intensely here. So think of, and this is pretty much key to, um, it's pretty much key to how we are going to be shown, how we're going to define and show that energy transforms from one form to another. So thinking about a flashlight, the best way you can think about these examples is starting off with what these things use uh, for energy. So a flashlight's pretty easy. What do we put into a flashlight in order for it to turn on? And the answer to that is batteries. So what kind of energy then we have to ask, does, does a battery use uh, in that a flashlight takes advantage of? Well, we, we never really talked about batteries, and this is something you can Google uh, to, if you want a more in-depth idea. For the most part, I'll just tell you that, that batteries are filled with acid, and those acid the, the acid is then charged um, uh, at, the, like at, say, the factories, so like Rayovac or, or Duracell, you know, whatever it is. Um, the 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 you put some you put a particular acid inside of the casing you then charge up by adding energy into the the acid uh, and then pretty much it's it's a stored energy over a particular amount of time uh, so the battery is uh, the chemical energy well you put the batteries inside the flashlight the flashlight connects two ends of the batteries uh, or of the batteries uh, uh, to a particular little board. The energy uh, is then converted from the chemical energy in that acid to electrical energy in order to turn a light bulb on. Okay, well then that light bulb then transforms that electrical energy into the form of light or electromagnetic energy. And then you also lose a little bit too in the form of thermal energy. Okay. So, so, and I know that that seems like a lot, uh, but it's, it, it's, again, we just have to break down where specific energy is coming from and really think about, well, what is this thing? Like, what is it made of? Uh, how is it that energy goes from one spot to another in it? Uh, and then we can come up with a decent idea. Okay. So what about a match? Well, a match uh, is going to kind of similarly start off with chemical energy. So that little red end uh, of the match is, is it's like phosphor. It's, it's something with phosphorus. I'm, I've actually forgot 
I just forgot while I'm making the notes here. I'm forgetting what exactly is at the end of that, but it's it's some kind of phosphorus molecule. Um, but but uh, but anyway, that red end is where pretty much all that stored energy is located in the form of chemical energy. Okay, so and then uh, we take that chemical energy and we can we then use kinetic energy, uh, also mechanical energy, uh, by moving our hand and the match over the strike strip on on a matchbox. So the strike strip uh, lights ignites the the match, and then uh, so we have chemical and kinetic energy that is then transferred and lost in the form of light and thermal energy. Uh, and arguably there's a little bit of chemical energy that's lost here too, because uh, you you know, as you probably know, you can definitely tell what's a new matchbox versus an old matchbox, simply because you'll know an old matchbox will have like the little, the, the strike strip, which is basically just sandpaper. You'll notice that there's a lot of strike, like the, there's a lot of streaks in it that it'll be a lighter color. Um, uh, it, maybe it won't light your match as well, all that good stuff. And, and, uh, um, and so there's a little bit of, of chemical energy that's lost there because you're also scraping away the little bits of, of material off of the um, matchbox as well. Okay. So just to keep on going here, so gravitational potential energy. Um, this is a, a, remember back to this. Remember, gravitational potential energy is, is just the, the potential that, uh, the potential energy that a system can lose or transfer uh, uh, based upon its height. So that's the, ma uh, the mass times gravity times height uh, guy here. So gravitational potential energy of an object is converted or transfer transformed into kinetic energy of motion as that object then falls uh, at, at whatever height it's falling. So as, a, as an example, this would be skydivers. So you can calculate how much potential energy a skydiver has at its max at their maximum height. Um, and, and which if they then jump, however much potential energy you calculate at their max height should equal to the kinetic energy at the end of their trip, more or less. Okay. Uh, same thing with seagulls dropping oysters on rocks, uh, to break them open. So, uh, when right before a seagull will drop them, you can, you can measure the amount of gravitational potential energy and, and that should equal the, the kinetic energy uh, right before the oysters hit the rocks below, okay? So it, it, this slide is just to say that uh, for the most part, gravitational potential energy usually just transforms into kinetic energy. Oh, my GIF's not working. Why is it not my GIF? Why isn't my GIF working here? Let's see if it works because I really want to show you. So when it comes to this pendulum, it's, it's kind of important to show you. Uh, that's a little, all the other ones were going, looking just fine. So what the idea here is for the pendulum, that's a little aggravating. So the pendulum here is another way of showing, you know, the transfer of, of energy. As the pendulum starts, the gravitational potential energy, and we're going to change this to, let's change it to like goldish. We don't really use gold. Yeah. So as the pendulum starts, the gravitational potential energy starts converting to kinetic energy. So it's to say that right here, this is the this is where the, the little pendulum will have the greatest amount of potential energy it'll possibly have. And so when you let it go, then it starts to move. It starts to move down this way. That's where kinetic energy begins to rise, okay? So it's converting that potential kinetic or that potential uh, energy into kinetic energy. So then at the lowest point of the arc, which is going to be right here. So right here, once the, the pendulum reaches here, that's when um, uh, the, it's going to have, the pendulum is going to have the greatest amount of kinetic energy. So why? Well, it's because it's at the end of its string. And for the most part, this is zero for potential energy. It, yes, it could hypothetically fall, or at least in this image, you could say, well, well there's there's like a distance from here to here where it can fall. Wouldn't that mean then that there's still some potential energy? Yes, um, but the idea being is that the lowest it can, or, or, or 
the idea is is that that horizontally you know this is the max height and this is the lowest height the the minimum height and and really nothing is below that so Anyway, so then anytime the pendulum gets lower, it's converting, again, it's converting that potential energy into kinetic energy. But then the flip side, anytime the pendulum is getting higher, it's converting kinetic energy to potential. So once this guy comes back around and, and is, say, like right here, okay, so it's swung up this way. So once it reaches its max, the max height it can reach on this end, then it's converted all of that kinetic energy back into potential, Okay, uh, but then as soon as it moves back the opposite direction, it then again just rinses and repeats. It changes from from potential to uh, kinetic as it swings back and forth. Okay. Oop, I'm going to turn my webcam on. Didn't mean to do that. Let me get rid of that and then turn this guy off. Hi guys. Okay. All right. So. And then this last example here, pole vault energy conversion. So for anybody who doesn't know what a pole vault is, uh, it's the really spooky, scary event in track. Uh, it's the one where a guy will, will grab a pole and he will uh, literally uh, throw himself over some sort of another pole uh, uh, using that first pole I mentioned. I'll have a GIF in the next slide I'll, in, in a picture in the next slide. So in this conversion, uh, it's to say that we start off with kinetic energy. Uh, so this would be in the form of a guy running. Um, and it is turned into elastic potential energy. Now it's elastic potential energy because you have the, the, that first pole I mentioned. That pole is bending. Okay, so they bend the pole. Uh, and in that pole, uh, well, you're storing elastic potential energy. So you're bending it, you're bending it, you know, outside of its normal shape. And, be, and because it's outside of its normal shape, it wants to go back to its original shape. And so that elastic potential energy is then uh, transferred into back into kinetic energy uh, of the person's body being shot into the air. Okay. So again, in here, maybe I'll draw a picture of it. So it's to say like this. So again, just so you can get, so we're hundred percent clear on this. It's to say that, you know, let's say that this is the, the normal form or here, actually, let's not draw it in, at the angle there. We're going to draw it like vertically. Come on. Okay. So this would be say the normal shape and form of the pole vault. But if, if you bend it like this, okay. In here, we'll even I'll make that a different color just so we can tell the difference. And then when you bet, but then when you bend it like this right here, what you're doing is that you're storing energy because what it wants to do, it wants to go back to this form here. And to get back to that form, it's going to take whatever energy you just put into it and it's going to push it in the opposite direction that you applied it. Okay, or in this case, it would be that that way but it's point being is that it begins like this uh it goes to this but then it wants to go back to this guy here its shape wants to be restored so think of a rubber band remember so a rubber band you stretch it out it doesn't want to be stretched out it wants to return back to its normal shape and form okay so whatever the amount of energy it is that you put into it to stretch it out that same amount of energy will be used to revert it back to its normal shape Okay. Okay. So uh, as a person gains height, the kinetic energy is converted into uh, gravitational potential energy. And then uh, at the height of the jump, so meaning at the maximum height it reaches, all of the energy that uh, has now been converted into gravi gravitational potential energy. As the person then starts falling back onto, you know, down towards the mat, uh, all that gravitational potential energy is now turning back into kinetic energy. And then once they hit the mat, uh, the pole vaulter then lands, distributing energy throughout uh, the mats in, in the form of, of thermal energy, mechanical energy, kinetic energy, a little bit of kinetic energy, and electromagnetic energy as well. Okay, so, so uh, we can see here that there's just this, all this transfer of energy. 
in ev- virtually every single step. Uh, so, so it's this is like what we're tr- going to try to practice and what we're going to do. We're going to um, uh, be moving through this the rest of this week, just really looking at systems and saying, oh, well, we start with this energy. It goes to this energy, goes to this energy, and then it, you know, and then it ends off with this kind of energy. Okay. So that's what we're going to be doing for the rest of this week here, guys. Uh, just remember that we are going to uh, remember we've got finals coming up next week. Uh, today is, gosh, is today, yeah, today's Monday. So, right, today's Monday. Oh my goodness. Today is Monday. Uh, so today's Monday, uh, for third period, your, uh, this should have, Mr. Sodaro sent this out the other night, third period, your final is going to be, uh, on Tuesday, eighth period, your final is going to be on Thursday. So make sure you take that into account. Uh, I will have some activities for you to do next week, uh, so just be prepared for that uh, and, and be looking out for those. It's really not going to be anything too substantial, they're, and uh, they're just to kind of keep you busy and to, um, you know, kind of expand some ideas when it comes to energy. So I'll, I'll keep reminding you throughout the week of what those will look like. But anyway, uh, if you guys still have any questions, make sure you ask me. Get a hold of me on uh, Google Classroom, through email, on Remind, whatever it is. Uh, And that's the end of the video, guys. So thank you for all of this, and I will see you in the next one.